All right, so um, welcome back, everyone, to the uh, second session this morning. And so Steffi is going to continue his talk on the competitive analysis of online algorithms. OK, so we, we, we've seen the general, the general packing covering uh, uh, framework. It, of course, uh, captures, m captures many online problems in, uh, for, for covering uh, You've seen online set cover. We can also do online connectivity, cuts, facility, location, paging, which we will see, and many, many more problems. For packing, it's uh, routing, matching, which we will see, and again, many, uh, man, many, more, uh, many more problems. Um, in, we, we've seen the algorithm the multiplicative, with multiplicative updates for general covering, uh, yeah, for for general covering and uh, 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 packing. Uh, so another another way of of describing of describing the algorithm, which uh, which is a, a continuous form is writing a, different, a differential equation uh, which describes the connection between the primal and the dual variable. And since it's an, expon it's an exponential function, this is the form of, the, of this differential equation. And this is how the, actually the, the exponential function is, uh, uh, is obtained. So let's see. What what kind of okay. what kind of results we can get? So uh, we can get log uh, we can get log d where d is the maximum row sparsity the maximum number of variables which are different, uh, which, 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 which are non-zero. Um, for, for packing, the bound that we get is, uh, depends already on the ratio between A max and A min, the maximum and the minimum uh, uh, entries in the matrix A min is different, uh, is different from zero. And uh, if we want, if we want to get rid of this, if we want to get rid of this uh, uh, of, of this of this dependency, then we have to go back and change some of the some of the dual uh, dual variables, which in a sense is equivalent to preemption. So that depends whether we. Allow that. It depends, of course, on the context. And then, there in, in, in work of Anupam Gupta and Vish Nagaraj, Nagarajan, they showed how to get a, a bound for the dual, which is uh, which only depends on the on the sparsity. Um, okay. Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah. Okay, which general generalizations uh, can 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 we talk about? So one uh, one generalization is instead of having a linear objective function, uh, we have uh, we have some convex function. Um, this convex function needs to have some bounded. We need to have some bounded uh, growth. Property, which is captured by uh, by this condition of the of the gradient, it turns out that for technical reasons we also need the gradient to be uh, uh, to be to be to be monotone, and in this case we can the competitive bounds that we can get are given by by this expression. For example, this captures uh, uh, p p norm p norms. Uh, People have looked at uh, uh, convex functions, minimizing with a with a convex function. The, for example, in the context of of energy, quite uh, quite quite a lot. Um, 
for, for, the, for the dual problem, for the maximization problem, this corresponds to, uh, to, um, online, uh, to, to online auctions, online welfare with production costs. Uh, maybe one will go back to, the, OK. The dual is now, uh, since it's a convex function, the dual is obtained uh, through a, a Fenchel dual, du uh, dual function or the co convex, convex uh, conjugate. Uh, I won't go into, into the details. Um, in this case, the update, the update rule is similar to the to the linear case, except that now in the denominator we have the we have the gradient, and that that gives us the differential the differential equation. Another, I'll just quickly talk. Uh, I'll just quickly mention another uh, another generalization is online semi-definite uh, semi-definite programming. So just I'll go. So let's look at this, yeah, at, at this form of uh, semi-definite programming. So we have a linear objective function, and we have um, we have matrices a1 up to a n with with a single constraint. Now this is bigger than or equal with respect to the partial order defined by uh, positive semi-definite uh, matrices. And this, and this is the dual problem. And we, and we have weak duality is very easy to, uh, to prove. Now, what would, be the, what would be the online version of this problem? Well, we can think so we're we have only one one semi-definite constraint but the matrix b evolves over time and it sat so everything is positive semi-definite and the matrix bt satisfies over time bt is bigger than or equal to bt minus one in the psd sense and X and Y, and again, matrix Y is PSD, and it grows on, it increases in, in, the, posit, in, the, PSD, uh, in the PSD sense. So how is this related to, uh, for example, to, to, uh, to set cover? So let's look at, let's say this is a set cover instance. We can think about it this way. It's a sum of matrices, so this is our set cover problem. And if we look at the matrix, then it, it's a diagonal matrix where the diagonal is exactly the characteristic vector of the, of the set. And the left-hand side needs to be bigger than or equal to, um, to a diagonal in all, uh, to an all ones uh, matrix on the, on the diagonal. So this is, this is set cover. In online set cover, this diagonal is being exposed to us uh, in, in steps. So instead of having uh, diagonal matrices, we can, the semi-definite covering problem is, um, is a problem where we replace the, the diagonal matrices by PSD, by PSD matrices. And as we saw before, B evolves, uh, evolves online. So, so now, yeah? So in this case, it's like you know all the all possible elements up front. You just don't know which ones need to be covered. Right, right. But this is also the version of uh, uh, one of the versions of online set cover, where you get in advance the set cover instance. You just don't know which elements you will need to uh, to cover exactly. Yeah. Can you allow changes in the A, ma A, A matrices as well? Uh, I didn't think. I didn't think about it. Okay. If if. Okay, you need to define whether the A matrix can can contribute to a particular entry. And this is more difficult. This is a mess to define in the in the PSD uh, setting. 
So let me just tell you what is, what is the algorithm. So the algorithm is a nice generalization of online set cover. So if, if this constraint is, via, is, uh, is violated, then there is a witness to this violation, which, which is a matrix V. And then this violation defines a linear constraint which is, which is not satisfied. Well, we know how to deal with that. So we, uh, we, just, um, we just do a, 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 continuous, a continuous update where we increase the matrix Y, that's a dual matrix, in the direction of V until this constraint is satisfied. Uh, there are several issues. So, so this kind of update uh, 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 guarantees a logarithmic, uh, logarithmic competitive factor. But the issue is whether this process will, uh, will, will terminate. Because, uh, OK, so we, uh, we satisfy uh, matrix V, but then there might be some other matrix which is not satisfied and, uh, and so on. And uh, one observation, let me just go quickly. One observation is that if we, uh, uh, yeah, the trick is that we go, uh, uh, we over satisfy the constraint and that will guarantee uh, termination within uh, and uh, at most n, n steps. And with a, just an fa increase, a factor of two in the, in, the competitive, uh, in the competitive ratio. Another, another uh, interesting issue is when you have box constraints, and then there's, you, one can define sparsity in an interesting way, but I think I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, and, and, and get a bound in terms of uh, in terms of this uh, of this uh, notion of sparsity, which generalizes the notion of row sparsity in the case of set cover. But I'll I'll, I'll skip that. Uh, we open my second presentation. So I want to go over these, uh, these topics. Um, let me start with another, with another example of, uh, of covering packing, which is, uh, which is ad auctions. So in ad auctions, we have these ads on the side. And uh, the way this works is that we have, we have advertisers, which set a daily, a daily budget. And then we have, uh, and they also uh, provide bids on keywords that are interested to them. That's not, it's not, a, it's not a game theoretic issue. Uh, we just think of it as a number they're willing to pay for showing their ad for, for those, those keywords. We have a search engine which needs to select, let's say, one ad per user, so user appears. He puts in some, this is a very simplistic model, of course. He, the user puts in some search word. This search maps to a bunch of advertisers which are interested in this uh, user. And if, and each of them, if each of these advertisers, if their ad is going to be shown, the, adversi the advertiser will pay for the the bid on that uh, 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 the, the bid that he committed to, but the advertiser also has a daily budget which cannot be uh, which cannot be exceed, uh, exceeded. So we can think of it. This is a bipartite graph. One side is 
fixed. That's the advertisers or the buyers, let's call them. Each one has a budget. And now we have the keywords or the items. They appear one by one online. Whenever an item appears, we know which buyers are interested in that item and um, what will be. So we are Google, Microsoft, whatever we want to maximize the total, uh, the total revenue. OK, so we can write this as an LP. So YIJ is just indicator for the Jth ad word going to the ith uh, buyer. Um, we want to maximize YIJ multiplied by BIJ. BIJ is the bid that the ith buyer had put on the Jth, uh, on the Jth item. And, um, and of course, each item cannot be sold more than once. So sigma YIJ is at most one. And the sum of the BIJs is at most is at most B, B of I. So we cannot exceed the budget of, an, uh, of, a, of a buyer, of, uh, of an advertiser. Um, OK. The prime of the covering problem is, of course, it's very similar to what we saw uh, with, with the routing. So the constraint is that for every edge ij, bij multiplied by x of i. So x of i is for a buyer, z of j is for an item. So bij times x of i plus zj is bigger than or equal to bij. And this is our obje primal objective uh, function. Now the natural algorithm is, of course, the, the greedy algorithm. When an item appears, you just sell it to the buyer, which is willing to pay the maximum value for it, as long as his daily budget hasn't been exhausted. This algorithm is half competitive. And unfortunately, it's not more than. This is the worst case. I won't show you. Uh, uh, and, uh, there's a simple, simple example. <coughs> what would be the primal dual uh, algorithm? Pardon? What is ZJ in Bruce uh, ZJ, well, it's, uh, it's a variable which corresponds to, uh, uh, to an item. So the buyers uh, are indexed by i, and their variable, each buyer is associated with a primal variable x of i, and each item is associated with a, a primal variable zj. The problem that we want to solve it, I know it's a bit confusing, is the dual problem. It's, we want to maximize this value. And we're using these constraints for, for that. And the, for every item j and buyer i where there is an edge uh, between them with value b i j, we have this, uh, we have this constraint. So ZJ corresponds to uh, to this uh, to, to to this constraint, and XI to uh, to this one. Um, okay, so instead of having uh, instead of having uh, a greedy a straight greedy algorithm, what we're doing is the following: we are assigning the item to a buyer. Uh, so the greedy algorithm was assign, uh, assign the item to a buyer that maximizes BIJ, as long as that buyer has still his budget. Here, we're using XI to discount BIJ, and we're maximizing, uh, uh, so we sell the item to the buyer that maximizes this expression, bij discounted by 1 minus xi. And the algorithm is, is the following. This, um, the value of xi is updated 
by, uh, by this multiplicative update. And when the buyer exhausts his budget, xi is going to be equal to 1, so we're not going to sell him any, uh, any, uh, any item. Uh, the proof of this algorithm, I won't go through the details, is very similar to what, uh, to what we have seen. The only, the only issue is that we have to, is, is with the last item, uh, sort of the last item allocated to a buyer, and with that last item, we may exceed the budget of the, of the buyer, so we have to, for the analysis, we have to give up on the revenue from that last uh, last item. So the competitive, we go. Um, yeah. So the competitive factor depends on big R, which is the ratio between a, an individual bid and the budget. And we have to make, to, to, we're going to the, the, approximate, the competitive factor is 1 minus 1 over E, which is, of course, an improvement over the factor of 1 half. However, we need the assumption of small, small bids. And it's an inter very interesting open problem getting this 1 minus 1 over E competitive factor with, without the assumption of small, uh, of small bids. Um, Do we know any lower bound there? No, no. So we can, the greedy algorithm always guarantees you a factor of one half. Yeah. And just getting above, not even one minus one over eight, but just getting uh, above one half, that's, that's very interesting. No, we don't have any lower bound. And in one, fact. One minus one over E is a low bound. Yeah, yeah, no, I meant between one half and uh, one minus one over e. Sure. Um, so, a special, a special case, going with your question, Mohammed, uh, a special case of this problem is online matching. In online matching, we want we have we have a bipartite. Think of the same model. We have a bipartite graph. One side is fixed, and the other side appears online. And we want to maximize the cardinality of the matching that we're generating online. So if we rephrase, restate this question in the language of the ad auctions problem, the budget of every buyer is 1. And each bid is also equal to 1. So as we will see, for this special case, here we don't, we, in, in this online matching problem, we don't have the large bids, the small bids uh, assumption, but we can still get the 1 minus 1 over E. So the open question is really in the, in the middle area where, let's say, some of the bids are uh, if the budget is one, some of the bids are half, one fourth, and uh, uh, and so on. If all of them are one, as in matching, then we, we will see that we can get one minus one over e. So if all budgets are one and all yeah. bids are one. Yeah, it? yeah, exactly. Yeah. But this means that there is no leftover, right? So, so you needed the small bid assumption because you the because I end. because of the waste at the but at the end. No waste. OK, either, either, OK, sure. But there's, but, TJ, but there's no reason to, to think, to believe, that, there's, that you cannot go above 1 half without the, the, the small bids uh, assumption. This, this, is, this is all I'm saying. OK. It's, OK, you're telling me that this is an easy special case, right? Online matching. <laughs> is no, that there's no waste here, so it's not okay. It makes life easier, right? So actually, this this problem was looked the online matching was looked at long ago by uh, Karp Vazirani and Vazirani in 1990, and they they suggest the, the the online matching problem, and they suggested the following algorithm. So as as in ad auctions, 
greedy algorithm or any non-lazy algorithm, which means that if you can match, do it, you're going to get a competitive factor of one half. So the question is, can you go, and, and deterministically, this is best possible. The question is, is there a randomized algorithm that goes above, uh, above one half? And here's a very simple algorithm. You pick in advance a random permutation over the offline side, over the fixed side of the bipartite graph. And you do it only once. This, once you have this random permutation, you, you run the greedy algorithm with respect to it. And, um, and you match, and that defines the priorities between the, the vertices on the fixed side, and, and you assign according, uh, according to that. And in expectation, this algorith algorithm turns out to have uh, the competitive, ex competitive factor is 1 minus 1 over e. But what is the relation between, uh, the, between this randomized algorithm and online, online primal dual? So we can go to, so let's look at the primal and the dual form formulation of matching. Now bij is, that we saw before, bij is equal to one and b of i is equal to one. So we just get, this is, these are the matching constraints and this is, these are the covering constraints. So for every edge ij, i is the fixed side and j is the online side, x of i plus z of j is, needs to be bigger uh, bigger than one. So if we take the algorithm from the ad auctions problem, then we can um, interpret, it, uh, interpret it as a water level algorithm. So yij, this is the water, and that determines the value x, x of i. And in practice, what this algorithm is doing is the following. Each buyer, that's the fixed side, has a water tube, which is initially empty. When an item comes in, it just starts filling up the, tu the tubes of his neighbors, and it does water filling, meaning, meaning that only he, he fills at any point of time the item fills up the water tubes, which are at minimum level. And of course, as the item starts filling up the water tubes, more and more, perhaps more and more tubes join the game as the water level of the minimum tubes reaches those, uh, those guys. So this is, this is the interpretation of the fractional, uh, fractional algorithm. And this gives a fractional matching of 1 minus 1 over e. But how do you make this algorithm into a randomized integral algorithm? That's a very interesting question. It's not, it's not clear because if you try to do some kind of randomized, uh, uh, randomized rounding with uh, some probability, which is not negligible, you will go above the budget, which is one in this case, and th that will incur further loss. And remember, anyway, we can get one half uh, deterministically. So how do you do it? Even how do you do it offline? I mean, even offline, how do you take, how do you transform a fractional matching into an integral one? Uh, the way I know is uh, just um, write it as a convex sum of, fra of integral, integral matchings. So in very interesting work of uh, Nikhil de Vanur, Bobby Kleinberg, and Kamal Jain from 2013, they suggested the ra a randomized primal dual algorithm. So let me give you two two views of this, uh, of this algorithm which are actually equivalent. So the algorithm is the following. Uh, we have these empty water tubes 
and each, each buyer picks uniformly at random a number yi between 0 and 1. OK, now when, when a new item arrives, so let's take first the view of the KVV algorithm. We can think of these values as determining a random permutation. They determine priorities between the buyers. And now when an item J arrives, he just picks the fr a free neighbor, the free neighbor which minimizes the value yi. So this is same as picking a random uh, permutation. Another view is through water level. So each item j has, let's say, an infinite amount of water. And he just starts filling up the water tubes of his neighbors as before. He, he always fills up the water tubes, which are at minimum. Once a buyer reaches the threshold of yi, he is matched to this, uh, to this item. And it's not hard to show that actually these two algorithms are completely uh, are equivalent. OK, let's see now the analysis. So the idea is the following. Um, when we have an item J, which is matched to buyer I, we're going to set the primal variables. So Xi is going to be equal to this value, e to the power of this random variable yi divided by e minus 1. And zj is e minus e to the yi divided by e minus 1. Now, where do, where do these values come from? So you can think of it as, so it's actually the derivative. If we look at the assignment of xi in the fractional algorithm, what we're doing, what we're assigning here is the derivative of that assignment, of, of that the derivative when sigma yij equals, y, uh, uh, equals yi. So the, the fractional algorithm, the assignment is the integral over these derivatives, so it's, it's an expected value. Here we're picking, the, uh, here we're picking this value y i, and giving the what if if we succeed in assigning, we're giving this va this the value of the derivative for y i. So it's it's not a one to one correspondence, but this is more like to think about it as the intuition where these assignments uh, come from. Otherwise, if an item is unmatched, or, or this should be, or a buyer is unmatched, then x and z are set, uh, set to 0. And it's not hard to show that um, the ratio of growth between uh, x and z uh, so, sorry, between the primal and the dual is e over e over e minus one, as we would have liked it to be. The only issue is feasibility, and here it's really interesting. You don't have feasibility. You have feasibility in expectation, and what they show, uh, uh, Devanur, Kleinberg, and Jane, is that. With this assignment, for every, for every ij, only an expectation, xi plus zj is bigger than or equal to, uh, uh, to, to 1. And now, why is this enough for proving the, the performance? Well, let's look at a particular pair, p 
PIDI, which is generated by the algorithm. And this, is, this is going to happen with some probability QI. Let's look, let's look at a primal solution, which is this convex sum, the average of these primal solutions. So it's going to be PI multiplied by, by QI. Now, by the above lemma, P is a feasible solution. Now, the expected size of the matching is just the value of the dual solution multiplied by QI. What we are interested in is the ratio between the optimal solution and the expectation of the cardinality of the matching, expectation of value of D. When we expand this, by definition, this is equal to these, uh, these two. The, the ratio is equal to the ratio between these two terms just by definition. And this is upper bounded by the maximum of value of pi divided by value of di. qi just cancels out. And we've, we've seen in the previous slide that this, this ratio, independently of feasibility is upper bounded by E over E minus 1. So we get that the competitive factor of this algorithm is, is 1 minus 1 over E. This is a very, uh, this is a very neat idea. It's extendable to uh, having weights. Now, OK, now to weights on vertices. So now instead of having just a a, a cardinality matching, we can ask what happens with weighted, uh, weighted matching. So the question is how, how are weights defined? So one way, one special case is when the weight of an edge, so if we have an edge from item J to buyer I, the weight of that edge is determined by uh, the weight of buyer I. So all the edges adjacent to a particular buyer are, um, uh, have, have, have the same weight, and this technique uh, is extendable to this, to this uh, special case, and it gets 1 minus uh, 1 over E. What happens with arbitrary edge weights? So in general, you can't, do, you can't prove any competitive factor unless you allow what's called free, uh, free disposal. So free disposal means that if you have matched an I, a buyer I to some item J, and now J prime comes in, and he, he offers a higher value, a higher weight than J, then you can match. You throw away J. You lose that. But now J prime is matched to I. This, pro, this uh, uh, for this version, the greedy, the deterministic greedy, guarantees a half. It's an interesting open problem going, uh, going beyond one half. One result that, uh, that in this direction is the case where the weight of an edge is the product, so the weight of edge ij is the product between the weight of i and the weight of j. So for this special case, if, the, if it's a complete bipartite graph, uh, there is a better than half competitive randomized algorithm, uh, which was suggested by Charikar, Hensinger, and uh, in, in UN. Uh, Isn't it only that actually we had for some time it appeared in, just appeared in ESA. We give also improvement over one half for the bounded degree case. For the bounded degree, okay. okay. So the bound depends on the degree, but I mean, it's like some matching covenant technique we have. We are using some kind of. Experiment. But that was already in work that I had with David Dwight here, who is also here. We, we, uh, we went above. Uh, that was in EC last year. But let, let's discuss this afterwards. The, 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 in, the, in the general setting, the problem is still uh, open. Uh, yeah? Uh, 
Is there a way to interpret the water feeding algorithm as some kind of entropic projection? That would be uh, interesting to, uh, not that I, uh, not that I know of, but uh, would be interesting to look, to look into this. Okay, let's talk about paging. Um, I have about 20 more minutes. Yeah, about that. Yeah. Okay, I'll quickly go over it. So, I assume everybody knows about the page, paging problem. We have n, n pages, and we have a cache of, uh, of uh, size k. And um, the requests are to pages. Each, each time we get, we, get, um, we, uh, we, we get a request for a page, if it's in the cache, we don't pay anything. Otherwise, we have to pay one or some weight which is associated with that page. We have to load it into the cache and the deci decision that we need to make is which, which page from the cache are we going to evict. Maybe in the next step we will be requested, the next request will be to that page that we evicted. Um, K is the best determ uh, deterministically, K is the best we can do, this is known uh, that, that this can be achieved uh, since the early day. This was actually in the original paper of Slater and Targen that opened up the area of competitive analysis. Randomized also log k is a lower bound and there's a log k uh, uh, algorithm uh, for both unweighted and, uh, and, uh, weighted algor uh, and the weighted case. Let me go, I uh, want to go quickly. So what, what, is the fractional, what is the fractional model? So we, we can maintain in the cache fractions of, fractions of uh, pages as long as those, if k is the size of the cache, the sum of these fractions does not exceed, uh, does not exceed uh, k. And if we have a request for a page, half of it is already in the cache, we need to load the other half, that would cost us half of the weight of the, of the edge. Uh, so the way to get the log k competitive algorithm is first develop a fractional algorithm and then do randomized, uh, randomized rounding and turns out that this, this is the easy part. Uh, you only lose a constant factor. Um, you can get this log k by using, writing it as a covering, pa in the covering packing framework and using ide similar ideas to what we have seen. Let me just show you a, di a different way. You can also write it as the following LP. So you can think, so y, ypt is the fraction of page p which is missing from the cache at, uh, at time t. pt is the page which is requested at time t. And z is the movement cost. So if, if we change uh, uh, we look at the difference between ypt minus 1, y, uh, minus ypt, then zpt is the value that we pay. So we actually pay when we leave the cache, not when we enter, enter the cache. And if y, uh, pt is the, current, is the current request, and so uh, at time t, if this is bigger than 0, then we pay, uh, then we pay uh, infinity. Now we can use this. Uh, uh, we can use this LP to get a nice, a nice fractional, uh, a nice fractional algorithm. I, I, I'll skip the details. I don't have, I don't have the time, uh, uh, time for that. But th this is interesting for the following. Uh, one one reason reason that look viewing the problem from this angle is interesting is that uh, let's, let's look at the 
problem of predicting from, uh, from expert advice. So we have an expert at every step that our algorithm has to pick an expert. Once the algorithm picks an expert, you see the cost of the expert and you pay that, that cost. So at the end, we want to compare the, uh, the performance of our, of, uh, of our algorithm, the cost of the experts chosen by our algorithm to the best fixed expert in hindsight. So the best expert, uh, the performance of the best expert, of course, in hindsight, when seeing the whole request sequence. This is called regret. This is another approach to, to online problems. It's uh, used very prominently in, in online learning, in machine, machine learning, in many, in many settings. Let me just tell you how this is connected to, uh, to what we've seen with paging. We can write, so first of all, uh, one, there's no really difference here between fractional and integral. So integral would be pick one expert, fractional, define a probability distribution over, over the experts. So here's a, not very exciting LP for the expert problems. It's modeled similarly to the, to the paging, uh, paging problem where movement cost is infinity. So essentially the optimal solution of this LP is just the static, the static best expert. Now, when we go to the dual problem, our al so the dual problem has the same, by strong duality, the same uh, uh, optimal value. But now our al now we're going to ha our primal dual algorithm w is defined in terms of the dual variables. And uh, again, I'll, 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 I'll sk skip the details, but I'll just tell you that it turns out to be weighted majority in actually in disguise. And the regret bound is proved comp uh, compared to the dual solution. And the so the, uh, the algorithm, of course, Changes, go, changes the distribution over the experts. But we compare ourselves to the dual objective function, which we know is equal to the best static uh, expert. And the known results on regret can be recovered uh, in, this, uh, in this way. Let's skip the rounding. Okay, the last topic that I want to, uh, to talk about is um, dual fitting in the, in, the, in, the online, in the online setting. So we saw dual, dual fitting was provided a very simple proof for the greedy, for the offline greedy algorithm for, for set cover, if you remember. Actually, it's also very useful for proving for proving algorithms in the, in, the on, in the online setting. So the idea is the following. We write the problem as an LP, but the algorithm is a primal algorithm. Primal is now the problem that we're interested in. Uh, it is oblivious to the LP, doesn't know anything about the LP. Duality is used only for proving the performance of the, of, the, of the algorithm. And we are constructing, so the dual solution is not constructed online as we have seen so far. It is rather guessed, of course, in accordance with the, 
algor online algorithm at the end. And if we do it correctly, then we can use weak duality as our lower bound. If it's a minimization problem, we'll use it as a lower bound. If it's a maximization problem, we will use the dual solution as, as an uh, upper bound. And uh, this is closer to, to, the, to analysis of online combinatorial uh, uh, algorithms. Let me go through quickly two examples, network design and uh, scheduling. So in online network design, we have some, uh, 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 let's say, unweighted, uh, unweighted graph. And we have, let's uh, focus on the case where we have costs on the edges. And now a request, let's, let's, let's look at the Steiner, Steiner tree version where we have a root and we have turrets. So in the, in the Steiner tree problem, we want to connect terminals to the root through the cheapest tree. In the online version, the terminals appear one by one and we want to connect them to, uh, uh, to the root. Through, an, through a tree which is not much more bounded, uh, the, the ratio between the online tree and the optimal Steiner tree is bounded. That's the competitive uh, factor. So this problem actually falls into the covering packing uh, framework. And fractionally, we know how to solve it with a logarithmic, logarithmic factor. I mean, it's this problem and many more problems in this framework. And the, prob the problem here is a rounding problem. How do you round online while maintaining a tree or maintaining the cost? Independent rounding is not going to, uh, is not going to work here. OK, so let's see. A very simple algorithm, the analysis, it was suggested by uh, uh, Imaza and Waxman looked at it back in 1991. And the algorithm is the simplest you can think of, greedy algorithm. When a terminal shows up, you connect it to the root through the cheapest path, where those edges which you have picked in previous iterations, their cost is now, uh, is now zero. There are many ways to analyze this, this algorithm. Let me show you um, uh, the, approach, uh, the approach through dual, uh, through dual fitting. So the idea is the following. Instead of, of having one dual solution, we're going to have a family of dual, uh, of dual solutions, actually log n, corresponding to different connection cost. So each will have, so if the connection cost is between 2 to the i minus 1 and 2 to the i, that will define a family of dual solutions. We can assume that we have only log n such levels because, remember, we're doing this at the end, because those connection costs, which are very cheap, for example, less than d max, d max is the maximum connection cost, less than d max divided by 2 to the n, uh, their contribution to the objective function is at most d max over 2 over 2n multiplied by n, and so it's, uh, it's negligible. Anyway, we have to pay d max, even opt has to pay uh, d max. So now the idea of dual fitting is very simple. If we have, so the dual solution here is a set of balls. And if, if the connection cost is between 2 to the i minus 1 and 2 to the i, then we'll have a ball of radius 2 to the i minus 2 around that terminal. What we need to prove is that all the guys which belong to a certain layer, all the balls in a certain layer, are disjoint. And then they define a feasible solution. 
And the reason for that is that if they were not uh, uh, disjoint, they had an intersection, then I could have shortcut, I mean, I could have gotten from the terminal to the root in a faster, uh, uh, through a faster route, uh, contradicting the greedy choice of the algorithm. And since I have, so each, fees, each, each family, each, each radius defines a feasible dual solution whose value is a lower bound on opt. I have log n layers, so we, I get a log n competitive ratio. Such ideas can be used to solve more general problems like Steiner Forest. In Steiner Forest, there isn't a single root that I want to connect, but at each step I get a pair source sync, and that yields log square n, can be improved to log n. It can also be used for analyzing online network design uh, in a slightly different model where we do cost sharing. So now the cost of a path is shared, is equal. So each edge is equally shared by the, or equally paid by the terminals who use that edge. And using dual fitting, we can show that if we look at an online process where terminals appear one by one and run the greedy algorithm with respect to this measure of cost sharing. It's different from Steiner tree that we defined earlier. We can get a log square and competitive, uh, competitive ratio. A, dif a different family of problems where this, this can be applied to is scheduling where we want to minimize the, the flow time. We have a set of machines and, and a bunch of jobs. And we have a matrix PIJ which tells us how much time does it take to run job I on machine J. It's an online, uh, it's an online problem, so we don't, uh, we don't know in advance which jobs we'll need to run. When a job J arrives at time RJ, we know, we know of course, PI, the mat PI, we know PIJ for all machines I for that job J, and we also know a weight WJ of that job, and um, we are allowed, we're allowed to do preemption. So we ca when we run jobs on, several jobs on a machine, we're allowed to preempt the jobs. But we're not allowed to migrate jobs from one machine to, uh, to another. Now the goal is we want to minimize the flow time. What is the flow time of a job? It's the time that elapses between <clears throat> the release time and the completion time of the, uh, of the job. And we want to minimize the sum of the weighted flow times. Wj is the weight of the job, which is given to us when the job uh, shows up. Uh, to get meaningful results in this model, in the online case, we need X to provide the algorithm with extra resources. And this means that the, uh, the online algorithm can, is faster. So he, the all, online algorithm uh, processes one plus epsilon units uh, of a job in one, one time unit. The machines are not identical. Uh, you have a PIJ. So PIJ is the time that running job J on machine I. Okay. Okay. And this is arbitrary. So uh, running a job on one machine might be much faster than running it on a different machine. But you can run as much as, uh, as I possible. mean, it can also be infinite, so which means that you cannot run it on that machine. 
Um, so we can also define the weighted flow time as the total weight of the jobs which are al alive at time, uh, at time t. So, um, so this is so the what what would be the fractional the fractional flow time needed for writing an LP relaxation? So if the fl if the integral flow time is just the sum of the time units between the release time and the completion time, to do the relaxation, uh, we. Let's define PJ of T as the remaining processing time of uh, processing of job J at time T. And uh, the contribution, the contribution of a job to the objective function is going to be at every time unit PJ of T divided by the total processing time. Now in general, uh, so, so for example, in this gap between 5 and 12, since we have finished 2 thirds of the job up to here, in this time window, we will be, the fractional algorithm will pay only 1 third multiplied by the 7 uh, time units. Now, of course, this is not a very good relaxation because the integral algorithm has to pay, let's say we finished almost the full job up to here, integral algorithm will pay one time unit up to here, and uh, the fractional algorithm will pay uh, something very, very little for every, for every time unit. So this is why for this relaxation we will also need this assumption of uh, uh, of extra extra resources, we can write um, we can write an integer program. So x i j t is one if job j is processed on i during time uh, time t. Let's see. So the fractional flow time is of j is the sum of, so let's see why, why this is the case. So let's look at time, you, at the particular, we allocated, let's say this is one for job J on machine I at time T, this is equal to one. So how, how many times did this time unit contributed itself to the flow time? So it happened from the release time up to time t when we did this, uh, this processing. So it contributed this value divided, which, which is one in the integral case, but can be any fractional in the relaxation, divided by pij multiplied by t minus rj, the number of times that it contributed itself. So the, this is the objective function. And now we need to, uh, to finish all, uh, all, the, uh, all the jobs. This is our, uh, uh, th this is our uh, uh, constraint. And um, this is actually not, not enough. This still, I mean, these constraints do not, we, we can still take a job and split it between many machines. So to avoid, and then we, we can do it very quickly, and this is a force against the rules. So to avoid this situation, we add another term to the objective function, which is the sum of the processing time. So um, this, is, this is our LP. Let me just tell you uh, quickly, uh, quickly how dual fitting uh, c comes in here. Uh, the algorithm is going to be a greedy algorithm. So when a job arrives, we have to decide on which machine we're going to, to run it. 
and we're going to dispatch the job on the machine for which the increase in fractional flow time is minimized. In the unweighted case, we're just going to run SRPT, which is shortest remaining processing time, on each machine and choose the one on which this increase is minimized. In the weighted case, we'll have to do it with respect to density, where density is the weight of a job divided by the remaining, uh, remaining processing time. But notice that the priorities are, f uh, by, are fixed between the jobs uh, once, one, once they arrive. And this algorithm is analyzed by through the through through dual fitting I'll, I'll skip I'll skip the details but the idea is to guess values for the alpha the, the dual variables or alpha and beta it values for them which correspond to the to the flow to the fractional flow both to the fractional flow time and the actual flow time of the, of the algorithm. I'll okay, I'll stop here. <laughs> <laughs> We can restart, but uh... Uh, maybe in the interest of time, let's uh, take the, the questions offline um, and break for lunch and come back at uh, 1.30.